I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right, here we go. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David DiLorenzo of Associ Association Analytics, and it is my pleasure today to welcome you to our virtual discussion series where we bring together leaders and learners each week in fun and engaging sessions that are aimed at optimizing business results and staying relevant in challenging times. Today's session is on virtual board meetings and what you really need to know today and into the future to design and conduct effective meetings with your volunteer leadership. Just a note that a recorded session um, will be available after the webinar. And during the webinar, we wanna hear from you. This is gonna be a very interactive chat today and your opportunity to talk to some, some seasoned veterans in the association space. So please use the chat tool to talk with each other, send us questions. There is also a Q&A button to submit your questions for our panel. Um, I will be interrupting them throughout their presentation today with good questions from the audience. And we will also dedicate a little bit of time at the end to uh, answer some of your questions. And if anybody feels game, we're happy to invite people into our panel discussion and you can jump on video and have a quick chat with us or share some of your stories. So like I said, this is all about interactivity today. Um, so now I would like to introduce our presenters, um, but unbeknownst to them, I'm not reading the bios because basically with all the credentials after each of their names, it would just be redundant. Um, instead, uh, we're gonna make it a little more fun. Um, and as we all prepare and think about our phase reopening here in the DMV, um, I have a little question for them to hear about what they've been doing. So first we have Lowell Applebaum, who's the CEO of Vistacova. So Lowell, please say hi to our audience and tell us what your favorite quarantine hobby has been. Hi to our audience. Uh, favorite, favorite quarantine hobby has probably been cooking with my kids. Uh, I've always, I am not artistic in any way, except perhaps in the kitchen. I think that can be an art form. And so it's really been a great way to end the day and uh, being home so much and not in the air, I've been able to do it more and more with the kids. And so we've been able to start to move move past grilled cheeses to some more complex dishes, but it's been fun. I like grilled cheese. There's nothing wrong with, with complex grilled cheese sandwiches for, for sure. Um, next, we have Mark Dorsey, who's the CEO at Construction Specifications Institute. So Mark, same question. Tell, say hi to the audience and tell us uh, what has been your favorite quarantine hobby. So uh, thanks, David. Hi, studio audience. Um, you know, most of my hobbies are outdoor hobbies, so we've had to transition a bit. Uh, but I would say it's accelerated my wine tasting program. And uh, something new and unusual, I uh, started reading books again. Well, that's, that's certainly a novel. Like literate. <laughs> <laughs> Get it, novel. Right? But where was yeah. the drums were supposed to be but I'm um, And then last, but definitely not least, uh, my good friend Jeff Shields, who I've actually known the longest of this trio um, and actually worked together in two different organizations. So Jeff, uh, say hi to our audience and tell us your favorite quarantine hobby. Uh, thanks, David. It's great to be here. Hi, everybody. And uh, I realized in the first few weeks of the pandemic that I wasn't moving around as much as I should be. So uh, my Facebook colleagues and actually some uh, ASAE fellow friends were uh, on Facebook talking about the Peloton. So I decided to dive in and join Peloton Nation. And I won't, I won't say it's love, but... Uh, <laughs> It's, 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 I like it and uh, I'm still new at it, but I'm sticking, I'm trying to stick with it. So uh, that's been a good, that's been a good diversion. So I'll, I'll have to look you up, Jeff. I do have my Peloton shoes and I do have my ID and I've not been on that bike for one minute in the year that we've had it. So. Okay. I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit better than. You're, you're a little ahead of me. So. <laughs> All right. That's great. Um, so what are we going to be talking about today? I mean, you know, when I, when we first kind of dove into this pandemic, I, I know we, we did a session, there were tons of sessions on how people are managing virtual events and obviously people were in the midst of canceling their big annual conferences and things of that nature. Um, there wasn't a ton of talk about, yeah, but there's a ton of other meetings we do with how we govern and, and run our organizations with our volunteer leadership. And they had kind of the idea of talking about, you know, what about virtual board meetings? And I know people have done semblances of that um, but with the same model that we are thinking about around virtual events, it's kind of a chance to reshape 
possible virtual meetings and virtual board meetings and look into the future. So some of the things I want uh, to talk about today and got some great uh, guests here on the panel, really there's things around designing and executing successful virtual board meetings and not just for now, but into the future. And having some experienced folks um, on this panel, they're gonna talk a little bit about successes and pitfalls and really kind of reimagining that future of governance and volunteer leadership and the things we do in what's currently a virtual world, but it's probably gonna be more of a hybrid world in the future. And then tying in a little bit of data and how you, know, you can use data for some strategic health check along the way to make sure you're hitting those, hitting those goals from your strategy. So um, I think we have a poll question, Brian, is that correct? Talking to Brian, he's behind the scenes. And Prashant, this is where and I maybe, want to maybe we didn't get the full question put up. But that's all right. You guys can tell us in the chat of uh, how many how many of your associations have already conducted a virtual board meeting um, already. So that would be that would be the poll question. There you go. Got a slide. Just don't have the poll. <laughs> Hey Jeff, we, we keep moving on. Oh, we're, we're seeing a bunch of people say yes. So yes, we I have I all of them. assume this is of interest. It is definitely of interest. We were before COVID. Yeah. Great, great, great. All right. Okay. Um, so, so what we're going to do is I want to dive in a little bit with each of you talking a little bit around some of your experiences with um, in COVID, but even how you prepared and, and how you've worked with virtual board meetings in the past and what you're thinking about into the future. So I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to spend, you know, four or five minutes kind of chatting around what they've done, some good and bad with some things that, some quick lessons learned. Um, and then we're gonna spend some time as a group talking about some of the strategy around this. So I'm, I'm gonna start with uh, you, Mark. Thanks, David. Um, I think one of the things that COVID has done is for those folks who are thinking a bit more about how they were going to engage virtually, it's really, accelerated the game. Um, you know, as much as a year, year and a half ago, we had actually moved um, more of our board briefings into the, you know, for all of us old board hands, the what I did on my summer vacation uh, reports from staff, or, you know, if there was an emergency uh, topic, we moved those into really short 45 minute to one hour uh, board orientation sessions. Uh, we'd already planned to move our board orientation to, being a, uh, to taking a page out of the e-learning playbook where people would look at the didactic in our learning library and then our online would be more of a, uh, would be more of a Q and A uh, and we'd tee up some case studies and have some conversation in order to anchor the learning. Um, so we'd been moving down that path. Um, we are about to hold our first 100% virtual board meeting. We'll, we'll bust that up. Uh, into shorter chunks, build in breaks. Uh, I just shared with our board a Zoom rules of the road uh, in order to be able to be more intentional about the facilitation. And a lot of that was actually inspired. I wanna give a, a shout out to my colleague Lowell here because uh, Lowell uh, the, uh, was uh, uh, destined to facilitate a, um, a big time strategic planning meeting around components that would feed into the board. And the day before we were all to arrive, uh, the president made uh, a, a speech which caused half of the attendees to decide they were not going to fly the next morning. So um, it, you've never seen anything like it. We actually had uh, laptops facing each other. We had multiple Zoom iterations going. We had a giant conference room to ourselves. But I think the main thing is that uh, uh, as a facilitator, which is going to be a lesson for our board chair, you had to be very intentional about how you call call on folks, draw out particularly the introverts, uh, use the chat tools for those who aren't comfortable kind of raising their hand. And uh, all of that is to say that that still plays into what our roadmap had been for the future of governance. And this is the point I'll, I'll, I'll end on. Um, board meetings, if they're focused on the fiduciary stuff and the, and the things that we all have to check mark anyway are about as boring as they can possibly be. Board members, you know, board members on the one hand tend to feel like that's the thing they're supposed to do but they don't really derive satisfaction from doing it. So um, we've implemented uh, some uh, tips from the Carver governance model. So the board is very focused on the idea of what are the ends you're trying to create for your organization and leave strategy as a management discipline, though we work in close partnership with the board. 
uh, and the fiduciary reporting back to the board so that most of their time is focused on what if conversations. And I think the challenge in a 100% virtual world isn't going to be something we should have been doing as managers anyway, which is guiding boards to that conversation. What, what, you know, what are the opportunities out there? What are the big what ifs? What are the big challenges? Uh, what are the big resources that we might not have thought about as a staff? But really uh, moving them more towards uh, being intentional in that conversation when normally, and one of the things you'll lose in the face-to-face -face is some of the spontaneity or you know, the, the conversations that happen at the breaks. I think that's gonna be the challenge going forward. And, and my last point for, for uh, those on the audience, um, make sure that your rules, your governing documents and your state regulations allow you to do this. Um, I've had a couple chapters calling up and it varies state by state. It's, it's just one of those forest for the trees things that are really easy to overlook, but uh, we've worked really hard to make sure we're on solid ground, uh, ground with our legal and insurance teams. And Mark, before I let you go, I should say, go, tell, tell everybody a little bit about your organization and who your members and who your board is. Sure. Uh, so we're about a 7,000 member organization of construction specifiers. And specifiers are basically the people that intersect between architects and the contractors to make sure your building is built right. Um, they're the ones who, uh, who uh, fill in most of the contract documentation related to uh, the built environment. Uh, many of them are architects, engineers, contractors, building owners, facilities managers. Uh, we have 133 chapters with 10 regions, very complex organization focused on standard setting. Uh, so they are, by the way, very into the fiduciary on occasion. Thanks, Mark. Good intro. Um, next, going to move on to Jeff. Tell us a little bit about M MBOA. And we had Mark who's getting ready to have his virtual board meeting. And I know Jeff just, um, just had a virtual board yeah. meeting. Uh, I did. Thanks, David. So I'll, I'll first start with uh, MBOA. And, and what I love about uh, being on calls like this is that I don't think my organization and my membership could be any more different from Mark's, but almost everything he said is exactly the same work we've been doing, especially around virtual board meetings. So um, MBOA is the National Business Officers Association. Uh, we're about a $6 million organization, 19 staff. Uh, 1,400 U.S. Uh, member schools, about 250 more around the globe. Our members are the CFO of pre-K through 12 uh, private schools, independent schools, day schools, boarding schools, prep schools, uh, and then other individuals that perform the business office, uh, business office type functions, HR, uh, controller, accounting manager, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's who we are. Um, our first foray into a virtual board meetings actually happened a few years ago. We had a very techie board chair and uh, he thought we shouldn't be spending money on three meetings a year, that we should have a virtual board meeting. Um, and so um, we did that and we ran a new director orientation, went right into a full board meeting. Um, I think looking back, we created a kind of in-group and out-group. There were certain people in the office, there were certain people on Zoom, and that wasn't really uh, desirable. I think it's important to uh, say that our board is a, it's a very personal board, very collegial. They really like uh, each other. They nice. enjoy their board work. Uh, um, okay, so they have personal relationships um, and literally, uh, our board members, when they turn out, tears are shed as they say goodbye. So fast forward, um, the pandemic has probably changed everything, I think, for folks. Um, last week, we did have our first uh, new and improved MBOA board meeting 2.0 entirely different experience because our approach was entirely different and it picks up a lot of the threads that that Mark shared. Um, I think for a while, I think this is very important, especially in the virtual environment. Um, we uh, really want to focus on uh, a virtual board meeting that really provided getting the business done of the organization. Uh, where it allows individuals to contribute in a meaningful way and that they have a valuable volunteer experience. So those are always the, the three things that we talk about when we talk about what kind of board work 
we want to be doing. Um, so for our first, uh, for this virtual board meeting, it really re forced us, I think, to rethink everything. I think we were much more intentional. I think that was a word I heard earlier about the work, about the experience. Um, we have pretty good governance practices. Um, I think on our warm-up call we talked about, we don't count pencils uh, and, and ask how much we're spending on it in the budget. We're fairly high functioning, so I think that's good. Um, we do, uh, we use a consent agenda that consumes probably almost all committee work except for new business. Uh, we do a board member scan. Uh, we always include uh, an aspect of board development, or at least we, we intended to do that. Uh, and we have a generative discussion. The only reports that are standard on the agenda are from me and the board chair. Um, so at our first meeting, we really worked this as a staff. We had a small internal team. It was myself, my number two uh, executive assistant, our meeting planner. And we really looked at every component of the meeting and either reimagined it how it would work in the virtual environment, or if it didn't work in the virtual environment, we just would eliminate it. So for example, we had to reimagine our board service awards and um, we did, we decided to eliminate board development. We just weren't really willing to take that on. In fact, board development is always the hardest thing to get our board engaged around. Um, so we just said, let's not, let's not go for everything in this go around. Um, but we really took a lot of time to think about the design, um, how we're going to use the technology. Uh, we wanted to run breakout sessions. So we, we thought that was important to the generative discussion. So we wanted to make sure we were able to do that kind of seamlessly. Um, we had to do an executive session. So we had to think through kind of who would be in the room and who would text us to know when it was over so staff could come in because you know our staff runs almost every aspect of the board meeting behind the scenes. Um, so it may sound like overkill, but we really uh, focused on the both the in-person uh, you know, experience, um, what were they going to experience on their end, um, and and really just kind of say let's let's run this through and and make sure that we know what we're doing and it just seems like things are harder to fix in a virtual environment. So um, a couple things that I think are going to be common themes um, that we did: the shorter work times were great, uh, the the longer breaks were fine. We didn't lose people. Um, uh, the break, uh, the breakout groups that we did via Zoom were actually better than they are in person because we always have people lagging and um, and going to get coffee or taking a restroom break when it's not the time and um, having those times and have people kind of you know Star Trek teleported into breakout rooms and the countdown clock yeah, back out great. were great. The board nice. service awards were phenomenal. It was probably the best part of the meeting. Um, everyone had a beverage of choice. We uh, sent recipients uh, their awards in advance. The board chair was prepared to make personal remarks and we still got uh, some tears shed, believe it or not, even in the Zoom environment. So um, I'm gonna, uh, I'll probably just stop there uh, and look forward to the discussion. But if I get a chance, I, I wanna also share some of my experiences on the ASAE board uh, and working on the ASAE Strategic Planning Task Force, which is currently happening right now. And we're doing that entirely virtually uh, as well. And so I was a little bit skeptical about uh, strategic planning in a virtual environment, but I am no longer, and I'm sure Lowell has some uh, opinions about that as well. So I'll stop there, David. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I mean, Lowell, I know you, you know, you facilitate and work with a lot of boards. Um, so, you know, give us a little bit of, you know, what you're seeing with your many clients that you've been working with and then some of your own personal experience as well. Sure. Uh, pleasure to be with everyone today. Uh, I'm going to probably speak about work with the boards, both from a context of both board meeting and strategy sessions, because I think there's probably overlap with both. Uh, the work I've been doing with organizations as a place to start on surprisingly is to take a first fresh look at the agenda, right? Like, the agenda for better or worse is the guidance and North Star of what you're gonna do with the board. And so what I've seen is that organizations are transferring to a digital digital format in order to hopefully have their board connect and do the things, needs to look at the various pieces of the agenda. So for every item on the agenda, the first question we usually talk about is what is the outcome for that specific item, right? Is the outcome a place of decision? Is it a place of discussion? Is it a place of information or a place of ideation? Right between decision, discussion, information, or ideation, you know what you're trying to like get to by the time you finish that item. With working with organizations, with each of those items, if you now know what you're trying to get to, it's a lot easier to say, okay, so what's the preparatory materials we need to send to get to that? 
right? What are the pre-reads? Purely like the death of the committee report during your virtual meeting, because people will quickly start doing email if you just have reports being read at them. But there has to be the balance that you're also not sending two, 300 page board books beforehand. So how can you actually align what you send before to what you're trying to achieve from each of those agenda items? Uh, the third point in terms of crafting a virtual board meeting experience is really the idea of like, what is the appropriate facilitation approach for what you're trying to achieve with each? If it's a place of ideation, you may want to do paired discussions or small breakouts and have people come back with ideas. If it's a point of like key discussion, you probably want everyone hearing what their various points are. And so what is the actual, the right facilitation approach for the end you're trying to get to? And then who's leading that facilitation approach? Uh, perhaps in typical times, the chair is the facilitator of the board meeting, especially in virtual times, if whoever is facilitating has a really hard time also contributing. It's such a need to have an active facilitator that pays attention, who's talking, who's not, who has to talk next. And so having a real intentionality about who's facilitating each of the sections be it a staff, be it an external facilitator, or be it a rotating facilitation amongst board members. The fourth thing I would say is that there's also the opportunity, since we're in a virtual format, for any of those agenda items to say, if we could actually bring in a subject matter expert that could help aid the discussion or ideation, who would we invite to join the board for 10 minutes? Right? You can have people zoom in and join you for 10 minutes that are expert, be they on a committee chair, right, or an external uh, consultant or expert, right? they can come in, you don't have to fly them in. And so that's a huge like, capacity increase in terms of having the right knowledge at the right moment in the room. And the last thing just about like agenda constitution, which I think drives a lot of this like virtual board meeting and governance sense, is that every item on that agenda at the end really should be the who, what, when at the end. From what we've discussed today, like who's taking the ball next, what are they doing as the next step, and when are we having it come back? The one thing about virtual meetings is that it all starts to flow together. And so having that be sort of the coda at the end of like, okay, we're not going to forget what transpired, but like what's going to happen next is a really nice way to like bring that back together. Uh, so I'd say that's the agenda as the guiding thing I'm seeing. The one or two other things I would say is real quickly, number one is there's the opportunity to rethink your timing around board meetings. You don't need to do two days at a time. You can actually do, okay, if we have something, we can have like an hour and a half here, two hours next week, two hours a week after that. And you can actually build on that, right? So if there's a key area of decision to be made, but there's time to make it, perhaps the, like the discussion is this week, and then there's time for them to ruminate before they come to the decision next week. You don't have to cram it all in. So to leverage the use of timing around that. Uh, and then there's probably some other best practices I can share as well, or other thoughts that we'll probably get into. Uh, I'll end on this. We're talking about virtual now because we're in a place of isolation. I think the real place we need to also start focusing is a place of like hybrid governance meetings. Because the truth is, if you think about like reopening or coming back or however you want to frame it, one of the first things that are going to be live and coming back are probably going to be our governance meetings. Because there you're talking about getting 10 to 30, maybe 50 people together. You're not talking about hundreds or thousands. And so it's a lot easier to gather a small number in terms of like how to space those people or what's going to be allowed by the law or by social norms. And so we're quickly gonna to get to a place where people are gonna to start to meet in person for some, virtual for others, and the intentionality when everyone's not in the same medium is gonna to have to be designed as well. That's a, that's a good segue into some of the discussion, Lowell, around, um, you know, we wanna talk about some of the hybrids and, and just a question, I'm reading the chat and some things that I've, I've actually experienced too. Um, I want us to go into a little bit about, our, a little conversation, this can go any way we want it to go. Um, around who attends and what opportunities are there to expand and provide other or, or opportunity other opportunities for your organizations to diversify their board whether it's internationally or in different ways um, as we think about hybrid meetings but the other side and we didn't talk about this as we prepped for this um, many organizations and i'm not sure about your guys you know the board meetings are pretty much open to the general membership and as you move into a Zoom environment? Are you opening that up or considering opening that up? How do you how do you open it up to the broader membership? And you know, when that happens at an annual conference, you know, you might get a small spattering of people who take the time because they don't have a lot of time to pop in the room and listen to a board meeting. But removed from that construct and it's open, is there a concern or thought that, you know, hey, a large swath of our membership might jump on and listen to a board meeting and how does that affect them? So a lot I just threw out there, but I know you guys can bat that around a little bit and talk about it. 
Don't we know that you have thought go about ahead. Go, Yeah, you go ahead and start. Attending. Not like go ahead and start with that, Lowell. <laughs> uh, I will just say that from, I was with a, a group about a year and a half ago that had their board meeting open. And so there was, as you said, like a handful in the back, right? Yeah. And one of the people, one of the members in the back was a lot Facebook living the board meeting. And it freaked the board members out. They're like, how, but what if we say something or like that? That's not allowed. Like, like what I'm saying is actually gonna be broadcast. And the disconnect between like a public board meeting means actually in this day and age before isolation and virtual means that it's for public right. consumption. Right? I'm not sure that as as concept is new, just that as execution of concept seems yeah. to be where we're at now. Uh, and so I think there's a number of steps. I would actually pose the question to, to Mark and Jeff in terms of as you're structuring you know, the, the portions of executive session, the portions of board meetings, uh, how are you working with your boards to decide which parts of that are you know, shared and interactive? Or once you share it with your membership, are you then saying it's okay, this is probably public as well? Or what are the layers you're thinking? <sighs> Uh, I mean, Mark, you can, you can take that because I um, we don't have public board of directors meetings. We're a C3. We operate very much like a professional society. Uh, and funny enough, no one's asked <laughs> to, uh, to witness, are, witness our the, board meeting. Uh, the board meeting is not open to your general membership. Mm -mm, mm -mm, it's never come up. And we were very, we're very... Um, <laughs> You know, uh, we're, we're very, the way we do things are the way we do things. But, but honestly, I think it's compelling. I mean, no one's really asked. Uh, but yeah, it's not something we really, I've dealt with. I didn't deal with it at previous associations either. I've always been kind of this education model. Um, and, uh, but the, and I do like the idea of the opportunity for diversifying your board oh, and creating know. greater access. We do pay for our board members to get to meetings. So finances haven't been a member, uh, been a barrier, but you can, you can diversify kind of the role in the organization and people mm -hmm. who have more opportunities then to be on the board because, um, they, you know, didn't have to go through their boss to get time away, et cetera, et cetera. One thing I do want to just highlight, um, as far as the, what I thought one of the biggest uh, benefits of that Lowell uh, made me think of was that the chat feature um, in a virtual environment because I mentioned our board service awards were really great. Um, and that's because the chat lit up with people saying really super nice things about the retiring board members. And when you did them face to face, of course, everyone's sitting there and they have to be quiet. So that was really, that was one kind of nice um, side. But the other side was I was uh, yeah. making the case for what I thought was a pretty big decision uh, for the board to move forward with. And of course, you know, I came in prepared to make my argument. And what was really great was through the chat function, uh, I was hearing like, Jeff, it makes perfect sense. Go for it. Jeff, this is great. I fully support it. And, you know, it was just, it was just in real time to know kind of where your board is, uh, what your board is thinking was a huge benefit. So that didn't respond directly to the question. I thought it was germane to what Lowell said. Mark will tell you how uh, to engage the public uh, with your board meetings <laughs> if he does that. Great. Well, Jeff, thank you for that opportunity. And it's, I'm gratified to know that somebody is the association embodiment of a deep state organization. So well <laughs> done. Very well done. Um, we just follow know, our I, bylaws. We just follow our bylaws, <laughs> Mark. That's right. You, you know, uh, I, so let me let me take the diversification side and then the transparency issue. Um, of late, you know, especially at CSI, we've been bringing other C uh, CEOs from the construction space as well as subject matter experts in. Uh, and a lot of one of the restrictions is around physically being at the meeting and that's not going to be the case. We have a CEO who's going to come in for an hour and a half on a Saturday to talk about the future professions. Uh, who was already prepared to come to a physical meeting, but I, I think it's going to actually increase the opportunity for us to bring other voices to the meeting as the board thinks about free ranging discussion. Um, we're not necessarily required to be open either from the board meeting standpoint, we do have an annual business meeting um, and that really runs very short. And then there are our town halls. And what we have done is we've, over time, had a series of town halls with membership so they could feed ideas back, both with the board and with myself as the CEO, which I think deals with some of that, that issue. Um, in my prior organization in particular, we used to go back and forth around 
the right of members and sunshine laws and what that looks like, because we had one group of members that said, well, you know, you're basically a city council and have to operate that way. Whereas others are going, yeah, but you're a not-for-profit corporation and you're here to represent the membership. And uh, the, the balance we've really tried hard to strike is the board still needs to be able to have a place in order to have a free ranging discussion about what ifs without that then becoming a political cudgel for somebody else to use uh, against you know, a, a given board. And so we're very, we're very transparent, you know, especially from a guide star standpoint about what we're doing, where we're going, what the work is of the board. There's actually a committee that brings out talking points following each board meeting. So the results of what we're talking about are apparent to the membership. Um, and, and I think that's what going to wind up being the balance that we still continue to strike because it, it's not that there is anything necessarily to hide but you bring a board of directors together to chart a course and sometimes that conversation's messy and they've got to be able to have the space to be a little bit messy, but still be transparent and accountable to the membership that they represent. Uh, I've, I've often gone back and forth to say sometimes associations embody the best and worst of private sector and democracy, right? When you get right down to it, we're a hybrid of both. But we, you know, at the end of the day, we're a not-for-profit corporation that has to demonstrate by its deeds as well as its words that it has the best interest of the of, of the members in mind. So, um, uh, a couple ways that we accomplish that also, uh, you know, apart from minutes and all those things being uh, or the decisions being public, um, I just wanted to go to one piece of technology we take full advantage of uh, are things like Board Pack and other virtual board books that really focus the discussion. And my fear about opening up to say four or 500 people is that the culture of the board would then shift from less of a discussion and free flowing conversation about what might be to uh, my, my biggest fear is the resurgence of Robert's rules of order. So now all of a sudden, like you see in a city council, you know the decisions largely ahead of time. There is some debate, but it's very tightly managed and it really doesn't serve where the organization needs to go. So that's the long way of saying I don't have, there, there's not a one size fits all answer. It, it very much I think is uh, in relationship to the culture of your organization uh, and also ultimately the trust that the membership has in the leadership that they select for your organization. Uh, if I could add two quick points. So the first point you made, David, uh, this is a real opportunity to actually embrace a philosophy of inclusivity in reality. Right. If there were previously volunteers that were unable to serve whether on the board or other levels because they didn't have the economic strata advantage to fund their travel or their participation, this flattens that playing field. There are those that aren't going to be limited because of the fiscal realities that they're facing to getting involved. And that, that is in some ways hopefully an equalizer. It also allows us that when we have organizations that have a more global focus, that beforehand it was, yeah, we're global, we'll do Zoom meetings, but like they have to accommodate our, like our timing or like they have to be the ones to deal with the technology. Level setting that like everyone's on the technology now. And so how do we better incorporate those that are international or global leaders as well? So that's just a sort of a footnote to the inclusivity lens. I do think in terms of this place of being open about board meetings, reporting, right, the frame I often use with organizations is one of responsible transparency, right? Transparency of the board doesn't necessarily mean that everyone knows everything, because you have to have a, a, an environment where board members can feel safe having hard discussions, where they can have discourse and dialogue and disagree, right? And ultimately what has to emerge is what is the consensus vote and opinion and decision that's gonna lead the organization forward. Responsible transparency, right, is what is that decision? Why is that decision made? Where is that decision taking us and what do we invest in to get there? Right. And, and hopefully with that invitations where like members or committees or others can be part of that decision in the direction if it's part of the overall strategy of the organization. But the balance of having all of those discussions on an open platform because I've seen too many examples of organizations that have like political players that are going to like use what you say against you in the next election. And people won't actually say what they're thinking. And if you take that away, you're not going to have the real conversations that you, you want, you need your governance to have. And so I think there's a balance there of like open board meetings. So it's still being able to preserve the space that we want to give our leaders to do the work of leadership, 
which means to be able to disagree in a safe space, to hear we all are aligned to the same mission. Let's hear the different perspectives of how we're going to get there and emerge together on how we're going to then go forward. And if, if I can build one last, last point on that, uh, on Lowell's uh, point, um, one of the, uh, just call it a safety valve that helps uh, address this is when you have opportunities, and we actually have built into our structure a board committee whose responsibility is to bring in feedback from the membership to feed into a board discussion. And I think sometimes, you know, our traditional idea of a board meeting is we come unprepared, we're just going to argue amongst each other and throw rocks at each other, and then magically leadership is going to happen. And we know that's not really how it should work to be effective. But to the extent that the board is engaged in town halls, and I think Zoom is one of those, you know, all of these platforms enable this to happen more quickly with less hassle uh, and less expense. Opportunities for members and stakeholders to feed in on a regular basis so that your membership feels heard, then the pressure to say, but I got to be at the board meeting so I can lobby and make my case or I can use it for my political advantage, that, that then goes down. So there is an upside to all of this. We just defer it away from, but this is where the group takes in all of your input in order to make those decisions. And Lowell's right, you know, you've got to be transparent ultimately about what the decision making process is, what the decision was and who's accountable to it. Then, uh, you know, maybe Pollyanna to, say, Pollyanna to say everything's perfect, but that goes a long way to ensure that voices are heard. And when people feel heard, they're going to feel engaged with the organization. I think this has been a moment in time where we've seen some real steps forward in terms of organizations doing regular like presidential town halls right where their chair is regularly being present sharing what they're seeing in a real not like pre-scripted but in a real way and taking questions and i think ultimately if you look at like what a membership is looking for they're looking to have an avenue of connection and communication with the leaders that have been chosen or they have chosen to lead it doesn't mean they need to be in every board meeting but if you're creating other avenues for conversations so they can have their opinion and their perspective heard they feel like those leaders are, are able to represent those perspectives and opinions, it, it can allow that be a lever of like pressure release to actually do the board work that needs to get. That's great. No, I think that's very insightful on all parts there. Um, so as we talk about this, we're talking about, you know, how the boards function and work together. I know some of the conversations we had um, and we talked about a lot of the things you're changing or things that can work in this virtual environment. Um, and I think it was Jeff or Lola that mentioned earlier, you know, about creating experiences and, you know, some of that connective tissue of a board is that teamwork of the getting together and being face to face and the shared experiences that, you know, build the trust and the camaraderie of a board. When you think about virtual board meetings, you know, have you, Jeff, I know you talked maybe talk about how you try to create some of those experiences. I know you referenced the boards and we talked a little bit more about that. But Mark, what are you planning? Lowell, what have you seen? What are some ideas to build? You know, especially if we're going to be in this, you think new board members are coming in and you've got to, I know people probably aren't doing board transition right now. That may be delayed. Maybe that's another topic to add in here. But you know, you're thinking newish board members that may have come on board their first experiences are going to be virtual. Just account for some of that. Well, I just a couple of comments on that. We definitely we we did not uh, postpone our board leadership transition. I think we were we were just too far down the road. We had you know, we have a governance committee that interviews potential directors, puts forward a slate. Um, you know, we have a succession plan in place for our chair. So we didn't postpone that. So we did do uh, our director, new director orientation in a completely virtual environment. And I think it was fine. I think we need to think about that a little bit more around design um, and, and improve kind of the personal connections there. But it was pretty good. The comment I'll make um, around kind of creating that, that sense of connection among your board, which I said is very important, um, is something that we'll think about. We kick off our, our board meeting with a board member scan, and we want every board member to share two minutes about an industry issue or something that's happening at their school or something, a trend they see in their region. And it's really helpful to us to kind of get that pulse check at the start of each meeting. It also helps every board member speak from the get-go. So we've already kind of broken the ice and everyone's been heard. Um, they're also timed. I strongly recommend timing. I mean, timing, 
with a bell at the end, um, or it'll eat up your entire afternoon. Um, but you know what? We usually, in face-to-face, -face, had a lunch before we went into the member scan, and then the member scan was richer for it. And in the virtual environment, we didn't create that pre-scan experience, if you will. So that's something we're also going to have to think about. How do we create that that um, get, get to know you that 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 chit chat that happens prior to the business of the board to break the ice a little bit. Once we got through the member scan, we were fine, but the member scan was a little a little wobbly in the virtual environment. And I attribute that to, they, they didn't have the get to know you conversation. Great to see you, what have you been up to, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, uh, so I think that's something we'll need to work on and design into our board meeting experience for the future. You know, I want to pick up on uh, Jeff's points because I'm, I'm mindful actually of some of the things that have been said about Congress when people focus so much on leaving and they weren't necessarily living in the area and then going back to their districts. Uh, you know, a, a few years, more than a few years back, but that that also, that distance automatically broke down what had been relationships because we could be on opposite sides of the aisle, but our kids go to school and you build those personal relationships. And that is inherently going to be challenged by being virtualized and isolated. You, you just can't take away that bandwidth. But I think there are things that we were doing anyway or uh, preparing to do, both suggestions from the board and staff that can help. Um, one is, you know, uh, a mentor who's more experienced on the board, identifying somebody new and welcoming, welcoming them in. When new board members come in and we turn over, you know, 20 to 25%, 30% tops of our board every year, uh, the leadership calls these folks, welcomes them to the board. They're usually folks that we know anyway. And as a CEO, you know, I, I actually wait till the end of that. So my calls are upcoming to welcome them in but just to try to create that connection. Unfortunately, the common experience we may wind up happening is, hey, you remember when we were on lockdown for six to 12 months? Um, and you know, maybe there'll be some stories about that. So uh, we're, we're taking a look at some, uh, you know, things that we see our kids doing, whether it's playing a game online, doing something that's a little, uh, a little, uh, a little less heavy than just going right into the meeting. Um, and even from a Zoom standpoint and a pic, picked up this tip even from other webinars, which is let folks in early so they can welcome each other, say hi, talk over each other as we're all want to do, have a beer if it's a late afternoon meeting. And oh, by the way, uh, remember that us on the East Coast, we, we have to pay attention to not holding it at 5 a.m. Pacific time, you know, to, just to be respectful. Um, but anytime you can create an informal opportunity, even in something that is by definition a more structured environment, you create an opportunity for engagement with the board that's only going to benefit you. And, um, you know, I don't know that's alien. I mean, if we look at our kids' dating patterns, for example, they don't meet firsthand at the big dance like back in the day. They're meeting on, uh, online. So we're, we will ultimately have more folks who are used to this as a mechanism to meet each other. But I still firmly believe those relationships are anchored when you do get face-to-face and I think that's going to be the challenge when we get to hybrid, because I do not believe it's going to be like this forever. Hybrids, you know, six to 12 months away. And if I've got 19 people in a room, I'm lucky that's the size of my board. I don't have 150 in a house of delegates to, uh, delegates to figure out. Um, then that's going to be fairly easy. We, we could have a socially distanced board meeting now if people wanted to fly and stay in a hotel, which is really the bigger issue. So, you know, those are just a couple of the points I'd build on from Jeff. I guess I, I'll talk about these two separately. I definitely think at the start of every board meeting or within, you have to be as intentional about the social bonds you want to build as you do about the work you want to accomplish. That means every single board meeting should start with some sort of like light, I don't want to say icebreaker because it has baggage with it, but something, right? Show up to the board meeting with your Zoom background being the vacation that you would go on right now, right? Show up to the board meeting and we're, instead of everyone saying hello, we're going to go around and say, what was, the, what was the top reason why you ran for the board? And let's hear everyone's reason, right? Like something that is personal and that could be a connector amongst them, it's worth taking the time to do that. Number two is I think that I see the organizations that are trying to infuse into any board experience a regular shared learning. So whether that means like each board meeting, a different board members assigned to like share an article beforehand and five minutes discussing or what they learned from it, but some place of like, learning experience that can bond a board together 
And the third is if you want to really invest in it, you can still do social together. Right, send the ingredients out beforehand and have like someone who's a mixologist come on and everyone practice making the same cocktail at the same time. Right, Every, get like send all your board members some sheets of paper and have someone who knows how to do origami come on and everyone practice doing it for five minutes like a, an origami fold. Right, like there's keys, there's small like shared activities we can still do over this that are still social elements that are important. I'd say from the other side, the board orientation, I think this is a place that is necessary, a fairly radical shift. Uh, what I see, at least in most organizations, is that board orientation is here's your guide of however many pages. And we're going to do a new board member orientation, which is going to orient you to the organization and structure and some of your responsibilities. And really, like the thought around that has to be what are the other components that will have our board members ready to go on day one? What can be done before they run for office that brings them up to speed on the structure, that brings up on the speed on the responsibilities? They sign off on an agreement on what they're agreeing to do. So they start not having to learn that, but having learned it and agreed to it before they even ran for the position, right? New board member orientation shouldn't just be for new board members. Every time you have board members rotate on, you have a new team. And so besides a new board member orientation, Every time you have new ones come on, there should be a full board orientation, orientation to each other. What is our shared vision? What is our shared focus? What, how do we collectively interpret this strategy? So it's not just like the new kid syndrome of like trying to get your voice in with those who know each other, but there's the recognition that this is a new team that has to come together. And I'd say that within there, there's also the opportunities for like ongoing learning, right? And how do we then help them listen and other things as well. At least from an orientation standpoint, I think orientations that focus on like a single new board member orientation retreats as like primary focus are leaving behind the possibility of what you could do before and after as a full team to really make them much more ready to lead from day one. Great, thanks. Guys. And I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask at least one data question. So I know you can all crunch and you know, we are association that it's this data company. Um, and I've thought a little bit more about it as we talked today, because you guys were talking about kind of that whole, Mark, you talked about that member intake process where there's a lot of information coming in real time if some of these things are open in a more virtual environment. And there could be real time data that's unstructured coming in. Thought about how to kind of process that quickly or look for trends or ideas. Um, not making you answer that, but just in general, the other thing I know we talked about before is boards may have to focus down a little tighter to some short term strategic objectives. Um, how important is data going to be to drive some of these shorter term um, strategy discussions and decisions um, that may be taking place, you know, right now. Everybody want to jump in at once. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, Dilo, I can, if uh, I can, I could just share something on the screen real quick. Cause Absolutely. I'll just it's drive home. Yep. Is it shared down at the bottom? Here we go. That's a good thing about this. Everybody's like a Zoom expert now, so you don't have to teach anybody. Anything on the yeah, you didn't have to. I, and I can break <laughs> my computer and bandwidth in no time. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's always been important. It's not a factor of COVID. Um, the, the thing is, is I think in some cases, organizations get kind of focused on the wrong data points. Um, so, you know, unabashedly, I'm going to put a plug in for the, the, the Carver approach just because... Uh, the, the board of directors is responsible for setting what the end is they're trying to achieve for the organization to the benefit of the membership. What's the good you're trying to create for who at what worth of priority. So my job is to take, in this case, the board has something that the construction industry recognizes CSI as a leading resource for the built environment. I have the opportunity to interpret what that means. Here's what I thought I heard you say. And then my responsibility is to come up with data and information that provides evidence of progress to this end as interpreted. So in this case, it might be a survey about net promoter score. It might be sales of our practice guides, which are a couple that we've uh, uh, put together. And it's, it's not quite to dashboard, so I, 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 can, I can feel Mark Lowry cringing right now. But what it will get to is a, uh, you know, a, it's a red, green, yellow against our progress that comes up periodically. And we can do that with any set of metrics that we want. And so I, I put that up there just to say that, that um, the focus of data done the wrong way is an opportunity for micromanagement. That, they, the, that a board, it's a slippery slope, I think. And it's, it's because we, we feel better sometimes and it's easier to deal with either fiduciary 
or tactical issues because they're hard things and you can offer you can offer suggestions about what you would do in your summer vacation. Jeff and I have both served on the ASA Board of Directors. We've had many opportunities to second guess the staff because why, you know, <laughs> that's, that's what we do. But really what you're trying to do is, is, is engage the board in conversations about how do you advance the organization? What's the mission? Of, you know, what, how are you demonstrating that you are advancing against the mission of the organization? and engage the board in what if discussions and data can inform those discussions. But when you get down to a managerial level or a strategic level, what you hope you have is the relationship with the board is delegated that to you as a staff, but understand of course that as a staff, we are in service of the board and the mission. So I look at those analytics as nice to haves so that we, when we present to the board what our progress looks like, but don't lose sight of are we making progress towards a series of end goals that are the boards to define? Uh, I would just concur. I, I thought the model Mark shared was great. It looks very similar to what we're working on with our board. I mean, I work with primarily CFOs. Uh, CFOs like data. CFOs want to measure everything. Um, there's some things there are some things in association work, believe it or not, that can't be measured, but you can identify proxies that would say, well, if that's occurring and we can follow that data point, then the impact we're trying to achieve is, is more likely than not uh, to have been achieved and we can monitor for that. So I think uh, uh, we have an, it's eerily similar, Mark. We have an eerily similar spreadsheet uh, where we track and my goals every year are built around that. It keeps us focused on the strategic plan uh, and then it uh, allows us to revisit the progress we've made at least on an annual basis. If something's really going south, uh, it will be discussed uh, sooner rather than later so we can manage expectations before year end. But I think I, that, that model that Mark shared is very similar and really resonates with our board. And if I can build on that, sorry, Lowell, I just wanted to uh, tie off one thing that uh, Jeff mentioned. Um, it's really scary for boards to go that direction because it's counterintuitive. But what we found is once they got there and they started talking about the future of their organization, their stress levels went down and they got more engaged. And here is the big bonus. Our board meeting time cut in half. I'd be, I'd be interested to, I, I agree with that, Mark. I'd be interested to ask Lowell because what I have found is that outcomes, the impact you wanna have and the metrics you're going to use to measure that impact, I think that's absolutely the hardest part of, of the strategic planning process. And it's the part that really lives on, right? Of course, you're going to look at your goal, your strategies, goals, and tactics. But it, I think wrestling that beast every time is, is really challenging for boards. What's the impact we're going to have? Describe it. And then how are we going to measure that we're advancing towards that? Or how are we going to know uh, that, that the work we're doing is, is creating that impact? Lowell, would you concur with that since you're around more strategic plans than probably anybody? Yeah, I mean, I would say two parts to that. The first is from an input place. You know, organizations that don't experience analytics paralysis are much more able to act nimbly, right? Like you don't need to wait a year for all the research to come to actually decide where you want to go. From a place of output, I mean, where I see in terms of like the strategic visioning planning process, organizations that are thriving are those that have an overarching place of like, where are the places the organization is focused to achieve its mission and vision? Like, and then what does success look like for the organization statements with some strategies? But in terms of what you're talking about, Jeff, in terms of like the measurements, the metrics and the tactics, fine, the organization has them, but then it gives that overarching like strategy and success statements to its committees and say, now you define for your committees, what are your metrics and tactics and how does that feed in, right? To our components, what are your metrics and tactics and how does that feed in? So actually like the metrics of success for an organization are dependent amongst all arms of the organization. So it's all arms moving in the same direction, right? That's, that's where the giving the individual voice. So it's not just on the back of the, of the central organization to do it all, but to be able to like sort of claim it all as part of a place of unification, of co-creation, of collaboration, to move towards the overarching place of how are we achieving the mission and vision that's representative of our overarching organization. That's where I see organizations of strength, right? Really getting into like metrics and analytics, being by being able to divide it out amongst all the leaders and players that are going to be able to contribute in their tactics. That's great. Um, I'm going to 
I do have a couple of questions coming in from the audience, but just kind of as a last kind of one minute and we'll leave a few minutes for questions. Um, you know, I, I knew an hour would fly by with you guys. Um, so when we think about, you know, for people who are in the audience who are just embarking on this journey or, or cementing it as part of their overall process with hybrid meetings in the future, maybe one or two tips about how best to design it or a pitfall or something to look out for that you guys have seen or, or you've seen. Um, so just, you know, kind of, you know, we got a few minutes left, but just at least give a final thought and then I'm gonna have one or two questions for you guys in the audience. I'll give one quick tip. Maybe we'll go around giving tips. Uh, sure. I've given over or under on 90 minutes before taking some sort of break. Like less is better, much more than that. Like you're gonna see people's attention start to wane. You're gonna, people need to get up, bio breaks, everything else. Just as you're structuring your time, more frequent breaks where you have a collective understanding that when we say a time, we're going to start again at the next time. Really necessary. Can I agree with Lowell? <laughs> um, <laughs> don't, don't, don't be afraid of the breaks. I mean, in our face-to-face -face board meetings, we really, we, we have the board members there. And we don't want them to feel like they traveled all this distance and they have idle time. So we really jam pack the schedule in the virtual environment. It's completely the opposite. They're in their office. They're going to be distracted. You might as well just let them have breaks, um, take the time out, put lots of space in between. And, and we, I don't think we convene for, for definitely uh, more. We try not to do it more than an hour, but definitely not more than 90 minutes. Um, I think that's great. I would say, practice with your technology and make sure it works before you do the meeting. I, I, I think that was the, I underestimated how important that was and it, it was really important. That's the last thing you want to worry about when you're running a board meeting is, is that you, you didn't practice the technology enough and something surprised you or it wasn't working well. I'm not saying it's, it, the technology is easy and it's way better. It gets better all the time, but just practice it. Know who's doing what with each component of the virtual meeting. You'll be glad you did because you'll focus on the work, you'll focus on your members and you won't, the, and you won't worry about the technology at all. You'll have a better experience for everybody. So uh, to wrap up and build up on, yes, what Jeff and Lowell said, um, uh, there was a question popped up, how long are breaks? We're giving 30 to 45 minute breaks in between each 90 minutes. Um, and the reason for that is being present, especially in this uh, environment, really takes energy. Um, the phrase we turned, coined internally is exhumed. I'm just exhausted by zoomed. Uh, because you know, you're staring at a screen, we're looking at faces differently. It's harder to pay attention. Um, so you have, to, you have to build that in intentionally. And then I think to Jeff's point about not only practicing with the technology, there are little variations that are popping up, especially depending on which kind you purchased, Zoom in particular, that can be really helpful. So if you're not uh, facile with the breakout rooms, you know, I thought Lola had a great idea, which is, you know something, maybe we will do some one-on-one -on -one or four-on-one -on -one sessions. We did it with the strategic planning meeting. That worked out really well, but you have to build time for folks to rest, recover, or do what they do at the meeting anyway. Just go check your email because yeah. <laughs> we can now we can see you doing it. <laughs> Great guys, um, I'm gonna kind of do the wrap up part here, and if people are still putting in questions in the chat. I know the panel's been excellent at answering questions as they go, so keep it coming. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to say, you know, again, thanks for listening. Um, if you did take advantage of our little happy hour and you had a drink with you. I hope your, your minds are full, but your cups are empty. Um, we really hope you can join us in the future for more of these discussions. Um, just a reminder that we do, this is a recurring meeting, so it's every Thursday at three. If you've signed up for one, you've signed up for them all. So as you see on the screen here, at some of our upcoming events. Um, you see, we always try to bring together some, some uh, great panels of, of leaders in our community. Um, we are also just another reminder that we do record this. Um, so uh, everything is available for you and that'll be shared out via email. Um, and we do have one coming up next week uh, that is know your members, how to collect and use member data without annoying your members. Um, so that ought to be an interesting discussion. And once again, to the panel, it's four o'clock. Thank you guys for a fantastic hour and everybody have a great and safe rest of your day. Thanks so much. Thanks, David. Great seeing everyone. Thanks, Lowell. Thanks, Thank Mark. You. Thank you, everyone.